We're joined today by Jay Kansara, former government relations director at the Hindu American Foundation, uh, currently a leading community organizer for the Indian American community and a globally respected foreign affairs analyst. Uh, on top of all that, he's a great friend of uh, the Armenian National Committee of America, a dear friend of mine. We're very fortunate to be joined by him today to talk about uh, the priorities, the foreign policy priorities of the Indian American community and also prospects for cooperation between India and Armenia, between our community in the U.S. and the Indian community here in the U.S. Um, this is uh, really actually an enduring relationship, but a very old, old friendship that goes back many centuries. Uh, I was reminded um, of the first Armenian printing press, which was actually established not in Armenia, but rather in, in Chennai, India, which was then called Madras. Uh, some of the earliest Armenian writings on national issues were were written in India. And uh, there's a, a very, very great tradition of um, Armenian traders having worked and found a great success in India, working with, with Indian partners. Many Indian students today study in Armenia. It's really, a, it's a great relationship and we're, we're interested in taking it to uh, the next level. And uh, with that in mind, I wanna thank uh, Jay for being with us today and, and just uh, welcome you to our discussion. And, uh, and, uh, and maybe you could share with us a bit about uh, the, the Indian community in America, uh, a bit of the history of the community, then we can delve into some of the more uh, sort of the deeper dive subjects of our, of our topic today. Thank you to the Armenian National Committee of America and my good friend Aram for hosting me today. It's definitely a pleasure to be here with all of you. The Indian community in America uh, began migrating in significant numbers back in the late 19th century, even though they were uh, small in number, there were some agrarian uh, workers, farmers who had migrated to the West Coast. Um, the immigration uh, was then stifled by laws in America that prohibited or restricted immigration from Asia and through the 1920s. And then finally in 1965, the Immigration and Nationality Act uh, enabled um, large numbers of Indians to migrate to the United States. Most of the Indians that are here today, um, first and second, or excuse me, second and third generation are descendants of that wave of immigrants. And then um, since then there have been considerable waves of immigration uh, that have come under the H-1B visa program, which is the high-tech visa uh, worker program. And we estimate the Indian American community to be anywhere between three to 4 million in the United States across, uh, across all 50 states, obviously concentrated in more wherever there's larger numbers in uh, metropolitan areas. Indians generally tend to gravitate towards those areas, particularly the suburbs. Uh, and, <clears throat> the, uh, and we represent about one something percent of the American population. I think that um, the, we share many of the same communities. I think the, the immigration pattern sort of along the coasts and then a secondary migration, maybe a bit south and west. I think the footprint of our two communities is, is um, very similar. And as a result, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of interaction uh, in the professional fields, in, 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 in commerce and in education. And there's just a lot of interaction uh, between our communities. And that's, I think, uh, at the social level, educational level, commercial level, but yet not yet at the at the civic or advocacy levels and i think that's really a, a great place for us to for us to grow um, as a community uh, could you touch on sort of historically and and, and presently what are the, the what's 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 the nature of the civic engagement by the, the community what are the the main foreign policy priorities that that are, are at the top of, of your agenda absolutely uh, indian Indians in the United States have been civically engaged for a considerable amount of their time here in the United States. Uh, there was a member of Congress, uh, the Leap Singh Santh from California uh, during, uh, during the time that Kennedy was president. Uh, so he was the first uh, member of Congress of Indian origin. And then in 2013, there uh, excuse me, um, even before that, there was uh, Bobby Jindal and and then Ami Bera became a member of Congress. And now we have four members of Congress of Indian origin. Yeah, that, we, we have two, down from three last uh, session. We have uh, Congressman Anna Eshoo, Congresswoman Jackie Spear, both from the Bay Area, 
um, also home to a, a large a sizable um, Indian American community. And we had Congressman Brindisi from upstate New York, but he lost a very close race. We, we hope that we hope and uh, await his return to Congress, uh, perhaps next session. And the, um, I should also mention that uh, Kamala Harris, our vice president, is of Indian origin as well. Her mother is Indian. And, uh, and she also <laughs> migrated to uh, California when she came to the United States. So that, uh, that is a, obviously a, a point of pride for the Indian American community. Absolutely, and I understand that the India caucus in both the House and Senate is among the largest um, in either house. Absolutely, it is a bipartisan caucus that is a, uh, that is a very strong body of members of Congress across the political spectrum that seek to advance the U.S.-India relationship. And they are very keen on, uh, members of the caucus are very keen on ensuring that India, is, the relationship with India is at the forefront of American foreign policy. And they also want to ensure that America is at the forefront of India's foreign policy. I think that the bipartisan nature of that is, is essential. Um, a lesson we've learned along the way is that, uh, that you know, it's great to have folks involved in, in both parties, but at, at a certain level, your, your issue itself has to be a nonpartisan issue and advanced on its own merits, not as an instrument, let's say, of the Democrats or Republicans. So being bipartisan is always, I think, a, a strength in this town. It's not always easy, but it's uh, always um, a strength. So. Uh, how would, when you look at the, uh, the the agenda of the caucus and the agenda of the community, uh, what are the foreign policy priorities? Like, what would you, um, let's say, in a in a legislative meeting or sit down with uh, the Department of State? What are the issues that usually um, rise to the top of the agenda? Definitely uh, protecting India's sovereignty in the region against aggressors uh, is a key issue, and and I know we're going to get into that. Um, soon after this, but the primary uh, vehicle by which America is now engaging India is through the Quad, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which inclu includes Japan, Australia, United States, and India. And tomorrow, uh, the Quad will be meeting, of course, virtually. The leaders of all four countries will be meeting uh, to discuss how to advance this. And this has seen this has been dubbed many different names, but the Quad, for example, and then also Asian NATO. So it shows the importance of it in the American foreign policy structure. Yeah, I think that uh, that certainly India does face serious, serious regional issues. It's a complicated part of the world, unfamiliar to many Americans, but nonetheless, at the very center of kind of the, the geopolitical future of the world. And um, what would you say are the, the, the threats or the, the, the primary challenges that face uh, India in, in its region? Absolutely. So uh, in order for me to get into that, just allow me to, to give a very brief history lesson. India Perfect. was, India is a civilization that's 5,000 plus years old as a, you know, a culture, a a you know, the religions that, that emanate from India and the civilization and cultural practices that, you know, Indian Amer Indians uh, in India, as well as in the diaspora, practice today are, you know, date back centuries and millennia. However, the nation state of what is today India was founded, the Republic was founded in 1947 after it had gained independence from the British Empire. Uh, for over 200 years of colonial rule. And before that, India, the Indian subcontinent, was effectively under the rule of Mughal uh, kings and princes uh, across the, the subcontinent. And before that, you know, other uh, Hindu kings had ruled over the land and they had spread Indian culture vast and wide throughout Asia, uh, the what is continental Asia today, uh, the islands of the of the southeast uh, and South China Sea, etc. And uh, also, India is the only country that has an ocean named after the Indian Ocean, which is actually the uh, it makes up a significant part of the Indo-Pacific strategy. It is the Indian Ocean Pacific Ocean strategy, so it's a very heavy naval uh, component to that. 
so that uh, being said, when India became an independent state in 1947, uh, it was partitioned due to the uh, due to the impetus of the Muslim League of India, which was a political party that demanded a separate state for Muslims of the subcontinent, and there were they were primarily uh, concentrated in population in both the west and the east of the subcontinent, which is why we had two uh, parts of Pakistan, West Pakistan and East Pakistan. And on the western front of Pakistan, India has fought three wars with, uh, with Pakistan over the state of Jammu and Kashmir, which is Indian territory, however, was invaded by Pakistani mercenaries shortly after the ascension of, of the state to the Indian Republic. And since then, it has been a hotly contested, well, it's, it's been contested by Pakistan. It, of course, is Indian sovereign territory. And Pakistan has lost those three wars. And in that, and because they have lost those three wars, they have now, um, they have now resigned to using non-state actors and uh, terrorist jihadis in order to perpetrate uh, terror attacks against Indian armed forces, as well as civilians living in Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir. And that includes Indians of all stripes, Hindus, Buddhists, Sikhs, Muslims, and, and others. So this, uh, the jihadi narrative does not, uh, does not take any prisoners. <laughs> yeah, I think that we've seen that uh, in, as Armenians, we've seen that in the, the support of Pakistan for mercenaries uh, for Azerbaijan's war against the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh, which we call Artsakh. That's a, uh, a common thread, I think, that runs through uh, our, our experiences, is that we're victims of, of Pakistani aggression. Absolutely. And India, for uh, for decades, has been suffering from, in, from sporadic terror attacks, the most notable being the Mumbai attack of, of September 26th in 2008. And uh, thereafter, several other attacks have also been perpetrated. The current Indian government has taken the most uh, strongest stance against Pakistan's aggression and terror tactics and has really elevated uh, this to, a, to the international community. And so the international community has responded very well in India's favor uh, on this subject matter. And Pakistan, of course, continues to see, um, ha continues to, to feel the hostility of the international community uh, against its uh, terror tactics. Uh, obviously, America has been at the receiving end of those as well in Afghanistan on the northwest frontier province of Pakistan. And of course, Osama bin Laden, the notorious founder of Al Qaeda, was found in Pakistan before he was killed by a, Navy, a team of Navy SEALs in 2011. And he was found actually very close to the uh, to what is known as the West Point of Pakistan. So within miles of the most elite military academy of the country, you had the most notorious criminal. So despite receiving tens of billions of dollars uh, through, uh, through bills that were even passed actually by and championed by um, now President Biden, but then Senator, Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Biden, despite receiving tens of billions of dollars of humanitarian assistance, they have div actually diverted that money away from humanitarian assistance for their own people and have uh, used it towards advancing military and terror tactics against India and, of course, on, the, uh, on its Western front in Afghanistan. So this is a key issue that actually America and India are working very closely together on. Uh, in, the, in the Bush era, when, when Prime Minister Manmohan Singh of India was in office, there was they, uh, both Parliament of India as well as the U.S. Congress passed the uh, U.S.-India Civilian Nuclear Agreement, which is seen by many as the foundation by which India has 
elevated itself in the eyes of Amer of the, the American foreign policy establishment as a as a partner and someone who is worthy of of an alliance status with America. And so this relationship has only grown since that time. And we've seen uh, numerous, uh, numerous members, uh, excuse me, numerous prime ministers give addresses before, before the joint uh, session of Congress and, ha and many delegations from India and many delegations from the United States, including presidential and congressional have gone to India to further this relationship over the years. Um, most notably, uh, you know, every president in living memory has gone to India to, to, to visit and to uh, expand upon this relationship. I know that uh, this has been an education uh, for our community, certainly with regard to, to, to Pakistan. Um, I think many Armenians know that, that Pakistan, I believe, is the only country in the world that does not recognize Armenia's existence. That's, that's like 10 steps worse than not having diplomatic relations. For example, Turkey doesn't have diplomatic relations, a genocidal state does not have diplomatic relations with Armenia. They do not exchange ambassadors. They don't have embassies. Pakistan actually doesn't recognize the existence of a country called Armenia on the planet. And, and that kind of, I think, uh, that perhaps says it all. Um, on, we're learning also more about the, the recent um, uh, decision by the courts in, in Pakistan to, to release the, the murder of the murderers of Daniel Pearl, the, the Wall Street Journal uh, journalist who was, who was butchered um, in, in Pakistan. Uh, we, of course, know about the, the role that, that Pakistan played against uh, Armenians by sending uh, mercenaries to, to fight Azerbaijan's war against the indigenous Armenian population of Artsakh. And then I know we'll get me touch on this later, but um, the, the, the way that the, the, the U.S. and the West uh, is able to appease Pakistan um, is some there's a lot of similarity to how they they've treated turkey over the years and and the fact that these two countries are by all accounts cooperating now uh on nuclear weapons technology is all the more troubling and uh and this is if if appeasement was the answer uh until now it certainly cannot be the answer uh, going forward and um there's such there, there are great there's great cause for alarm both in terms of u.s relations with pakistan and turkey and i think uh and that underscores i guess the, the, the importance of these these types of dialogues and the and the cooperation that, that will come from them. Absolutely, if I if I may, Pakistan was founded again in 1947. That was what 24 years after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, and the impetus of the Muslim League of India to advance the cause for a separate Muslim nation was because the with the fall of the Ottoman Empire came the fall of of the of the ottoman caliphate and so therefore there was a there was a vacuum of global islamic leadership that pakistan that the republic of pakistan felt that it should it should and can fill um since you know pakistan's independence it has of course it has of course entertained extremist ideologies within its uh, within its populations and and as in fact actually um subjugated the populations to these extremist ideologies in 1971 uh, when the in east bengal they speak uh, they they're generally uh, culturally linguistically homogenous in that side pakistan uh, west pakistan which is what is today pakistan um, is actually a bit more linguistically diverse however the language of urdu was subjugated on them from the from independence and just a another bit of trivia the word urdu actually comes from the word from from the turkish language which means army and it was the lingua franca of the of the army of the mughal empire and therefore it was uh, you know pakistan effectively when it did become independent inherited that legacy of martial militant military uh, domination and Therefore, the military in Pakistan has actually ruled over 33 years um, and in its, in its very short history of 70 plus years. And, and even currently today, despite the fact that there is 
uh, that there is a democratically elected government. The military controls the budget. The military controls foreign policy and geopolitical strategy, as well as domestic affairs. And so uh, Pakistan's military has controlled the country for many, many years. And in 1971 in East Bengal or East Pakistan, they perpetrated a genocide that primarily targeted the Hindu minority, which was in stronger concentration in East Pakistan than West Pakistan, but still there was some in West Pakistan and, and also secular Bengalis who refused to capitulate to the Islamist agenda of, of, the, of capital Islamabad. And according, according to estimates, 3 million people were, were killed in that and uh, hundreds of thousands of women had been raped and Pakistan also denies this genocide. There have been some uh, attempts by uh, you know, few leaders of Pakistan to acknowledge uh, missteps and overreaches. However, they say that this was in the context of war. However, they, uh, it's very well known and was documented by then the Consul General of America in the city of Dhaka. Uh, Archer Blood in the Blood Telegram uh, that that Pakistan was targeting particularly civilians, intellectuals, especially women and the vulnerable uh, populations in the countryside, and uh, so I th this is actually 19 that happened in 1971, and I visited Pakistan in 20 excuse me I visited Bangladesh in 2015 to study the conditions of religious minorities. And I testified before Congress that the scars of 1971 are still very well, very open and will not heal until there is, um, until there is admission by the, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan for the perpetration of a genocide against the Bengali people. And this being, this is the 50th anniversary of, of that genocide. And, also the liberation of Bangladesh, which was uh, the liberation of Bangladesh was made possible by the support of the Indian military who believed that Pakistan had overstepped and was perpetrating genocide against uh, its people on its, on its Eastern front. So. Jay, I, I'm reminded of uh, a statement um, by Israel Charney, a great genocide scholar. He, he describes genocide denial as a celebration of death, uh, a reaffirmation of the doctrines of power that allowed the genocide to take place and an implicit message that they remain available to the perpetrator whenever they, you know they they see fit it's it's basically an implicit threat against a, a victim population that that what they did is just fine they were justified in, in their actions and they reserve the right uh, to do it again and in in that in in this we see a pattern also with turkey pakistan commits genocide denies it uh, in fact celebrates in the deaths um and the same is true uh, of Turkey. Um, Jay, we, we recently um, saw um, an international body, the, the, the financial, um, financial Action Task Force, which is a multilateral body uh, that reviews terrorist financing and, and corruption around the world. And they have placed uh, Pakistan on a, a gray list. There was some discussion of putting them on a black list, but also some discussion of getting, you know, graduating them off the gray list uh, based on uh, you know, what they're doing to control terrorist financing. Uh, our thought would be that in light of the, the, the terrorist attack on the Armenians of Artsakh that they participated in, that would be a reason to, to lock in the gray list and upgrade them to the, the black list. Um, there was a, a meeting in February, I guess they'll be meeting again in, in June. And, um, and how, how does that process play out? So thank you. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Aram. And thank you to the uh, Armenian National Committee of America for its advocacy and activism on this issue. I know you have thousands of signatories on your letters to Secretary of Tr the Treasury, Janet Yellen, to, uh, to advocate for this uh, in her capacity on the, uh, and to the Financial Action Task Force, which is headquartered in Paris. I, will, I, I should add that Pakistan and Turkey have this symbiotic relationship of actually celebrating uh, per, uh, perpetrators of genocide. There are actual streets 
named after the perpetrators of of the Beng of the Bangladesh genocide of 1971 in Ankara and Istanbul. Uh, this was mainly done by the Muslim Brotherhood networks of of leaders that supported Pakistan's position in 1971. And there are, of course, uh, there is a, a huge resurgence of Ottoman uh, of Ottoman revivalist. Uh, propaganda in Pakistan that has unfortunately because of the the, the pandemic has um, taken hold in Pakistan and I say that because Imran Khan the Prime Minister of Pakistan ordered uh, the state state broadcasting channels to uh, air the uh, ter popular Turkish show Arthur Grul Ghazi uh, about the patriarch of the Ottoman Empire he actually had it translated in Urdu and and uh, subtitled in Urdu and dubbed, and that uh, and he fed that propaganda to a captive audience of over two hundred million people, and you can see that on uh, I as I as I observe Pakistani social media quite quite thoroughly and actively, there are young children who are emulating. Uh, Arthur Grul Ghazi and say that they want to behead kafirs or infidels. So they are literally seeding into the minds of young children the Ottoman Empire's or the uh, or revivalist Ottoman propaganda, which will be the which will be the fodder uh, for a for, for more conflicts in the South Caucasus as Turkey tries to continue to uh, extract what it sees as its territory. Of course, they are invading and they are, they are, perpetra they are further perpetrating violence and genocide against the Armenian people. But Pakistan is just feeding into it. And it's very unfortunate. And we do hope that the American lawmakers will see this for what it is and sank further sanction Pakistan. Pakistan, as uh, many uh, of our uh, listeners today probably already know, is sanctioned under the State Department's countries of particular concern list. Uh, I, for, I forget if uh, which level Turkey is on. I think it's on the secondary level, but it is um, uh, Pakistan is, is sanctioned uh, under the countries of particular concern list, which hopefully the United States will actually start enacting some sanctions, some real sanctions, but it should go further and take uh, take it on the financial action task force list to elevate it to the blacklist, and it should join like countries such as Iran and South, excuse me, not South Korea, North Korea, <laughs> who uh, it actually supplied nuclear. Uh, nuclear technology and nuclear information on how to produce nuclear weapons. So uh, Pakistan is definitely a rogue state actor. And what is more fearful is that a NATO ally such as Turkey, who is known to uh, perpetrate rogue behavior in its region and against Syria, against Armenia and others, will now have access to nuclear weapons with NATO uh, an Amer an effectively American payload uh, and delivery capacity. Yeah, that that is uh, perhaps the the least discussed, most dangerous thing in the world. That is a fearsome combination of Pakistani nuclear weapons with uh, NATO delivery systems. Um, a, a year ago, I think it was uh, maybe a little more than a year ago, uh, during uh, Imran Khan's address at the United Nations, um, he spoke obviously about the 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 highest priority issues on, on the world stage for his country, which is usually what those speeches are reserved for. Uh, we were surprised when at the, the end of the speech, he devoted I maybe mean, about 20% of it to attacking Armenians, attacking Nagorno-Karabakh, attacking, uh, you know, basically echoing the Turkish line. Uh, that that sent a very strong signal to us uh, about the how seriously uh, Pakistan takes its alliance with Turkey to the extent that they would devote time at the UN General Assembly uh, to carry Turkey's water against the Armenians. And that's very scary. You mentioned um, about, about Turkey sort of completing the, the work of 1915. Erdogan recently called uh, the Christians, uh, but he, he, the Armenians, the Greeks, the Assyrians, Chaldeans, and others, he called them publicly a very old phrase in Turkish uh, that translates as the remnants of the sword. 
which basically means those we didn't get around to killing. And usually he's referred to the, the remnants in, in, the, in the land of present day Turkey and, the, and they need to be finished off. They're just the, the stragglers and the wounded need to be stabbed through the heart and be done with. Uh, but he's extended that now to include Armenia itself. And, and it's very clear that his, his intention is to simply you know, wipe out the Armenians in that part of the world. And, and Pakistan, uh, by all accounts, is, is fully on board. And that is a very, very scary prospect and uh, one that we cannot leave unaddressed. And I think, frankly, for us, uh, Jay, and, and this discussion itself is a great education for our community, but the more we learn about um, uh, Pakistan's destructive role, uh, the more I think we're going to see the Armenian community uh, become active on this issue, but not just the Armenian community. Uh, other nations who have concerns about, about Turkey, uh, including our Hellenic brothers and sisters, our, our Kurdish friends, uh, certainly Assyrians and Chaldeans, but also other uh, actors in the region, other communities in the U.S., people who believe in human rights, people who believe in um, you know, religious freedom. There's, it seems like there's going to there's a growing constituency that's going to start paying a lot more attention to uh, Pakistan's destructive role in the region and even the world. And I think that's that can only be a good thing because this policy of indifference or appeasement that is allowed uh, is all about to get away with so much. I mean, I think that that era has got to come to an end, but it has to start with you know with with communities like ours raising our voices, talking to our legislators, talking. Uh, to candidates who are seeking our votes and, and, and saying this needs to be addressed. Uh, I, I put the nuclear issue at the very top. I mean, we have our issues that, that deal with uh, India and Armenia. They're very important issues. They're, they're, they're core issues. Uh, but as a global threat, Pakistan and Turkey today represent a very, very dangerous axis. Absolutely. And Turkey has committed full diplomatic and even uh, I would say they, they're they even willing to commit military support to Pakistan's aggression in Kashmir. Uh, we I discussed the 1971 genocide, but in 1989, after it had lost the war in, in Bangladesh, and Bangladesh effectively became a separate state, Pakistan wanted to carry out another vengeful act against India and perpetrated a genocide Within Indian, uh, within the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, across the line of control against uh, another Hindu community, the Kashmiri Pandits, and uh, their their plight is still uh, not answered effectively. And the Pakistani military agenda has consistently said that they are within their right to to rid Kashmir of any infidels because it is uh, it, it should be the land of the pure. That is what Pakistan means. And so Pakistan continuously perp uh, propagates this uh, aggressive Islamist ideology uh, that Turkey has now, uh, especially with the uh, with the rise of Recep uh, Erdogan as the, you know, as a forever leader of Turkey. I think he's what he's he's had some constitutional amendment ratified where he can stay in power indefinitely now. He is effectively risen as the modern day Ottoman Ottoman uh, Empire or Emperor or even the Caliph. Uh, some some say he's he's uh, he's that he's of that stature. And so Pakistan is just feeding into that narrative now and and the war in Armenia and Artsakh uh, in the last few months is just a precursor to what further destruction will come if it is not checked by the international community, uh, particularly if it is not checked by America, who has the ability to sanction Turkey under violations of its uh, agreements and obligations to NATO and also to Pakistan, which unfortunately attained non-NATO ally status some years ago. So um, you have a NATO ally and a non-NATO ally that are just uh, getting together to do damage to their region and beyond. Yeah, the, um, this reminds me, uh, Jay, that uh, denial is not just a lie about the past. It's a, it's a doctrine of power that, that guides a nation into the future. And the, it's a clear, when, when, when Pakistan denies the genocides it's committed, uh, it's basically, as you've noted, just as, affirming for itself the right to, to do, 
to commit those crimes again. And, and there's, there's no regret, no remorse. It's actually, it was in their view, a good thing that, that was justified and should be uh, reproduced whenever the opportunity permits. And that's, I think an important lesson for folks who, who might think that, well, genocide recognition is something that's backward looking. Absolutely not. Uh, genocide recognition is forward looking. It's about protecting the living uh, in addition to honoring the dead, but primarily to protect the living, to, to reject the doctrine that this type of uh, you know, brute force can be visited upon innocent civilians uh, with the aim of eradicating them from the earth. That's, that's a doctrine that has to be rejected in every possible instance. And I think, um, and, and in that we, we stand, you know, shoulder to shoulder uh, with, with, with you and, and the rest of the community. Right. And in the, in the words of our, uh, of our Jewish American or Jewish friends around the world, their phrase is never again, and mm -hmm. we will never forget. And we, we cannot forget. And we should ensure that this type of, of rogue uh, dehumanizing behavior never uh, again is tolerated. Uh, and of course, genocide, you know, has taken different shapes and different forms in other parts of the world. But if we cannot honor victims of of deliberate of deliberate mass campaigns of hu human ethnic and religious cleansing um, from decades ago, I'm not sure we're able we're going to be able to solve this problem decades from now. It, Absolutely, it is yeah, a. I can't agree. It's a very, uh, this is something that I hope Indian Americans, Bengali Americans, uh, and Armenian Americans will, will continue to, to join forces on in, in this year and beyond. But also, uh, also, I hope that there are positives that our communities reinforce within one another that we should also look to. It's not all doom and gloom. We're not, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we, there are, I think there is a budding India-Armenia relationship that's coming on the sidelines of the last in-person uh, UN General Assembly. The Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi did meet with the Armenian Prime Minister in, a, in what was, I think, effectively the first bilateral meeting between two principals of, our, of those countries. So there's much to aim for and hope for. And I believe there, there is a, a, a Eurasian... Um, economic zone that India is a part of and Armenia is a part of amongst other countries, but, uh, the, but they have common cause in economics. And I think the diasporas, particularly the, you know, the American uh, diasporas of India and Armenia have out, uh, have, we have outsized voice and and potential to elevate that bilateral relationship in the eyes of american lawmakers as a positive and you know i would love to see a, a trilateral india us armenia dialogue happen you know sometime soon and i think that's a that that's something that we could shoot for i i, I can't agree more jane i'm i'm very excited uh, by our discussion today but also for all that it means for the future there's we're we're building on a solid foundation centuries old, a very enduring uh, friendship between uh, the Indian and Armenian peoples. As you said, there's also a, a partnership between uh, the republics. There's also uh, a common experience here in the U.S. You know, we, we, we live in, and, and, and work and study in the same communities. Uh, we have uh, common concerns about some of the bad actors um, in the region. There's, there's, so much, there's so such a very solid basis for, for our, our future partnership and also for growing that partnership and inviting, um, you know, uh, other communities and other other interest groups, people who um, you know, are worried about, you know, uh, say nuclear pro proliferation, people who are worried about uh, intolerance, people who are worried about, um, you know, stability uh, across uh, Europe, uh, Eurasia uh, and, and, and South Asia. This is I think there's very, very solid ground for a lot of cooperation going forward. I think this uh, discussion and discussions like this, we need to do uh, more often and we need to to broaden the circle and, and bring in uh, uh, our, our Greek American friends and, and others. And, and I think that um, I think that this can be at the start, I think, of a, a very a great new era in, in cooperation uh, between uh, Indians and Armenians, between Indian, Indian Americans and Armenian Americans. Yes, and the sky is the limit here. And uh, we are uh, I think we should continue these types of conversations in, in regular iterations, and we should have more speakers who are 
more knowledgeable than I am. I, I come from a background of community activism and of course, foreign policy, st uh, study of foreign policy. Uh, but uh, there are others who have, who are able to dissect this information even further. And, and there is inherent similarities between our communities that I think we, we don't even know how similar yeah. we are to one another. And, and, and there's a lot of similarities, but also areas, as you mentioned, where we can complement each other. And I think it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a great partnership. Uh, I would invite everyone uh, who, who's watching and following uh, this discussion to, to share their comments. Uh, to, we'll, we'll put our, our email addresses uh, in, in, the, in the description field. Feel free to write to us with, with ideas about how we can grow this partnership. Share this, uh, this video with friends uh, in the Indian community and in the Armenian community and, and from folks who are outside of both of our communities. Uh, let's really broaden the dialogue, uh, increase uh, the discourse, and um, and continue this this very very constructive partnership. And in that in that spirit, uh, Jay, I'll leave you with a, the final word. But I do want to uh, share with you our our great thanks for your time today and for your uh, commitment to um, the, the the people of India, the Indian American community, and to the partnership uh, with the Armenian people. Thank you. I just want to reiterate the same to our friends at the Armenian National Committee of America. We look to advocacy organizations such as ANCA to uh, guide us in as we develop these forums for our voice uh, here in America. We are a, a relatively younger immigrant community to the United States, so we look to uh, you as a big as a big sibling elder sibling and so we hope that you will also help us as we uh, find voice to combat the very strong lobbying arms of the, the Turkish and Pakistani nexus <laughs> as they have found a lot of willful ears for their propaganda we hope that the truth from our communities can can reign uh, even louder in Washington DC Thank you, Jay. We will certainly learn from one another and help one another going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening.